Um, I'm really delighted to be here today with uh, Jesse and Stuart, so we're going to do some very uh, short biographies. I'm sorry to say that Katrina Simon, who is part of the curatorium for this show, is unable to join us today. She's unfortunately ill. Uh, but just to acknowledge Katrina and also Naomi Stead and Wendy Steele, who are the co-curators of this exhibition and RMIT Culture, who produced the exhibition with us. So Stuart Geddes is a graphic designer working mostly with books. He's a lecturer, researcher and a PhD candidate at RMIT University and has worked with us integrally over the years, uh, but particularly on this show. And Jessie French is an artist who navigates the intersection of art, ecology and technology amidst the climate crisis. Pioneering in the realm of sustainable plastics, Jessie explores consumption, symbiosis, and sustainability. Uh, so today's conversation is going to be very much focused on the making of Wild Hope and thinking about the kind of process that we went through in terms of making this exhibition. We are also going to touch on some key works in the show that relate to, to the making. And I think we're going to wrap up at around about the 45 minute mark in terms of the more formal gathering here, but also invite you to come with us into the other gallery and to do an informal walk around with some of those works. So one of the things that I think is really important to acknowledge uh, with the making of Wild Hope, it is the start of something. It's actually an exhibition that, if you like, is the start of a greater research project called Planetary Cities. And this is a collaboration with Indy Jonga of Dark Matter Labs. And we had the great fortune of having Indy here with us to launch not only the exhibition, but to do a fantastic keynote at the Capitol. So I think this really folds into some of the ideas how exhibition making in a space like Design Hub Gallery can actually uh, formulate and start the beginnings of things uh, and to translate works in progress to public audiences rather than to be the kind of culmination of something. And the exhibition really is a way of uh, embracing and advocating towards this movement of a planetary commons. And it really is about demonstrating new approaches, new approaches and alliances between researchers. So in that way, it is a group exhibition. Um, one of our artists, Joel Stur, described it to me a bit like a mini Biennale, and I, I think that was a really lovely way of reflecting on it. In, in many respects, it's about scooping up a lot of the research works that are happening both across the university, but importantly, further afield with artists like Jesse and other creative practitioners in our community and really understanding those works and mediating them to a public audience. Of course, we did set ourselves the agenda of trying to make this exhibition in, a, we called it a kind of light footprint. We were very sensitive to that. But I think it's really important that we're explicit too about the challenges within that. Um, so there were lots of opportunities. Uh, so for example, we didn't have lots of uh, issues like freight. Uh, we were able to reuse lots of existing materials. And in many respects, we were working with work uh, that was being made in process or we could activate to be made as part of this exhibition. Of course, we were working with challenges too. It was labour intensive. We had a very short development time uh, of, of really only a few months to make the exhibition. So they were all challenges that we had to work within in that context. So I think, let's, without further ado, let's get into it. And Jesse, I think I'd like to start with you, if I can. And just to kind of set the scene a little bit, Jesse, uh, we approached Jesse as an invited contributor to the show, and she was, um, she came on board straight away with much enthusiasm. And you can see here that we have uh, these wonderful algae paintings by Jesse, uh, and Jesse will talk more to that in a moment. But one of the other aspects uh, of working with Jesse was bringing her right into the exhibition making itself, and the opportunity to really use the signage, the wayfinding, and the graphic development as a way of testing this algae material in the place of vinyl plastics. 
uh, which are obviously used so so uh, often in exhibition making and galleries, but also in retail environments, etc. So this was a really wonderful way to upscale those ideas. So Jesse, I think it would be great to start at the beginning and to learn a little bit more about the algae material, where it comes from, how it's harvested, how you work with it. Uh, tell us a bit more about that. Um, so I guess my, my practice started uh, with the issue that we have with plastics. Um, I have a history of working in the arts and I had a previous um, a whole kind of career working in the arts and that's how I'd, I've come to know these two before I got here. But um, what motivated me to start doing this was I guess the overwhelming issue that we have with a lot of materials that we use um, and particularly petrochemical plastics. Um, the link to algae is inherent there because when we're talking about petrochemicals, um, they are a fossil of algae um, that's been you know, compressed and aged for millions of years under very specific uh, conditions. But, but what we're actually dealing with here is a new algae. So um, I spent the beginning of 2020 before I had to come home in Morocco, which is where most of the world's uh, agar comes from. And agar, um, you might know it if you've worked in a lab, it's usually at the bottom of petri dishes. Um, if you're in the kitchen a lot, you might have come across it as like a, a vegan alternative to, to gelatin. Um, but it has a gelifying property. Um, and, and that is also the beginning of, of some long chain molecular uh, repeating kind of uh, chains of molecules which which are polymers and when you form polymers into a, something that is a thing it's called a plastic um, and it has a um, mechanical property where it can be molded and we we lose sight of that when we talk about plastics because often we just think about petrochemical plastics but it's really just the term for a material that can be molded so that's where it started where should I go next? Well, I think it would be fantastic <laughs> to maybe bring Stuart into conversation with you in terms of how, when, when I first came to your studio and we were looking at the works that might be available for the exhibition, Jessie showed me a test in her studio, which was very small scale, but a test of uh, cut lettering. Uh, in the place of vinyl and that kind of sparked this idea you know how might we in a space like Design Hub which in some ways is about testing ideas and, and allowing them sometimes to even fail that frightening word how might we kind of test this in the exhibition um, itself so there was lots of discussion between uh, Stuart at that point in terms of how we might work with this material, how we might approach it, how we might test it, and I guess mitigate the fact that there were certain constraints around it. So Stuart, do you want to talk to that process a little bit and, and um, how you work together? Sure. Hi. Thanks. <laughs> um, um, I get, you know, I, I was, because uh, I'd been uh, like aware of Jesse, of this work and also the um, the vessels and things that Jesse had been making for, for a while. Um, um, but then seeing the idea of, of this, I guess one of the things that I kind of really, that, that seemed really um, like a great opportunity and really inspiring kind of thing at the, at the beginning of this for me was to, um, to see how Jesse was like, had been going from this kind of like really weird interesting kind of science and art kind of crossover kind of space but also like um really blurring the lines of a practice between like art and science and design and then also through the 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 vinyl into um you know potentially like a like a production manufacturing kind of thing but that was in the early stages of of, of kind of prototyping um and so the you know, like we saw i saw this um this test that Jesse has stuck on the, the, the uh, glass door in the studio. Um, there's, a beautiful, there's a beautiful photo of it that's Jesse pointing at, like, touching this material, and it's like a word material, like, cut in this vinyl made out of this material. It's really lovely. Um, um, and I think, like, very, very early on, there was... Um, uh, there were these I ideas bouncing around of, 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 of minimising ways to reusing... Um, on the one hand, and then also um, 
uh, incorporating this new material, um, which is renewable in a kind of different way to the kind of reuse that you sort of see in these panels that we'll talk about later. Um, um, but I think like one of the very early ideas of, of how we might use the material in the kind of graphic design of the show is to kind of combine those ideas and use the entire, like try to use entire sheets. Partly to, even though that wasn't um, strictly required because in Jesse's work the, 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 the material is totally renewable, you can boil it down and remake it again. But um, we made this, we had a, a few discussions of that of how much we wanted, because also Jesse's working on, on um, versions of the material that look much more like vinyl, vinyl, like so there's a, a white sheet and a black sheet and it's smoother and, you know, like really readily replaceable like option for, um, uh, for the kind of vinyl that's used in shops and in exhibitions. And we kind of talked about wanting to use um, a material that's sort of like had a bit more of its organic um, algae uh, personality. <laughs> and it's fascinating, um, Jesse, to talk through and when, you, when we're in the studio with you, for you to show us how the material was made. Um, and for example, this timber panel that we can see up here right above us, um, you talk about making a kind of timber tea when you're making that particular work. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that a specific one like that is made? Yeah, so that one, um, th this one uh, that we're pointing out, just so everyone knows which one, it's the one with the, the uneven bottom. Um, and it was actually made with the wood shavings from a furniture maker down here. So um, Craft Victoria actually put me in touch with him and proposed that I... Uh, use the kind of byproducts of another craftsperson's studio. So, um, yeah, Thomas Lentini is a beautiful furniture maker. So, um, he had a lot of really, really beautiful wood shavings. And for him, uh, when he when he saw this piece, he was really, really touched because he he kind of looked at me and said, "These are absolutely phenomenal timbers." And the amount of you know shavings, like I said, can you bring me some? And I thought that would be a box, but it was. Giant, two giant uh, garbage bags. Like, thank God I've got a trolley. But, um, and you know, he was kind of like, look, you know, this is just, I have to throw it out. There's nothing I can really do with it. But, um, so what happens with the, the pigment from a timber is that it has tannins in it, um, which you might know from wine or from, from tea. Plants have tannins in them um, and they, they leach out a, a colour. Um, and there's some other things in it that can give it some colour. There's some flavonoids and there's also some, um, some chlorophyll, which, which will fade. But the main colour you're getting is a tannin. Um, and this has got a lot of oak, so it smelt absolutely beautiful um, when it was being, being kind of cooked. But yeah, that was a process of, of essentially just boiling up these wood shavings and, and filtering them out. And I think, again, it's really um, helpful to re share the, the moments of um, challenge and when we had to kind of navigate those. So we did have originally one of the timber panels that was uh, cut for one of the opening uh, panels. And because of its almost like fruit leathery type of uh, texture, which is so extraordinary, it, it literally it was alive on the wall. It was kind of moving and bubbling and unfolding. And, and so there's always that tension of, of do, we let, do we just leave it and let it behave and peel off and, and uh, bubble and we accept that that's part of the character or do we need to replace it because it's, it's perhaps going to fail to a degree where people won't get to enjoy it. So those points of tension are always really interesting when you're working with these um, more experimental processes. Um, you've got a certain duration that you need to work within, but also allowing people to understand that this is an exploratory thing. Um, so 
Stuart, do you want to talk a little bit about that in terms of how we met some of those challenges and, and perhaps it leads into a discussion about the didactic panels as well because originally we did envisage they might be in algae but we moved to found materials. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, there's a few things there. I guess the... Um, uh, there, there was a... There were quite a few moments during the during the design of the show um, where we had to shift course, and it was because of the nature of this, like this kind of really emerging exhibition and uh, the the ambitions for it and the unknown of a lot of the materials, like the algae to a certain extent, but also the this use of kind of found materials. Um, um, and I think, you know, that's just a really exciting prospect, I think, of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's with Jesse's material in particular, like being able to work with it at this super early kind of prototype stage as it's kind of heading into, um, you know, the next stages of kind of development. Um, like, in, you know, being able to be involved in the, in the kind of, in, in that, testing and kind of, and like coming up with questions more than anything, you know, like whether it, like one of the panels not adhering as well as another, did that have to do with the tannin or was it the thinness or was it the, like... I mean, the, it answered questions for me as well because right, what happened yeah. with that sheet is that it had some of the sawdust still included because we were, tr we were trying to put a little bit more organic personality but... It, it's about working out and, and in that process, you know, I can answer questions as well because for me the mechanical property of it is that the, the material um, absorbs moisture. That's, that gives it the ability to be recycled in water at the end. Um, but it also means that it will change with humidity. Um, but when you have sawdust in it, that also acts as a, a bit of a sink for, um, for the humidity. And so that's why we got the, um, you know, the changes in the, the topography of the sheet, um, which is not so great for sticking a huge sheet of it on the wall flat. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and so actually the, um, the, that intention to kind of show these big sheets was actually kind of working mechanically against the, the, the material, so, mm. you know. Set us a challenge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and it has become a bit of a ritual in the morning, this kind of quite beautiful caring for these sheets uh, as the exhibition's opening. In fact, Lisa from the design uh, culture team was was just, sorry, RMIT culture team, was just here earlier smoothing out very carefully the panel. So this kind of idea of care for the materials themselves is really important. Certainly there were discussions um, around, as I, I spoke earlier, this kind of almost Biennale approach, this scooping up of live research works as well as some invited works was was challenging in a very short time frame to think about uh, allowing each work to have its own voice in relationship to this kind of overarching theme, um, to bring out those stories of hope. And the, the title is quite intentional. I mean, these are, uh, you know, serious issues to grapple with and uh, a radical shift towards this idea of a planetary commons and Indy spoke so eloquently uh, but also you know with such urgency about that at the Capitol the other night but also we were very aware that the exhibition needed to have an element of hopefulness and I think sometimes exhibitions that are grappling with these issues can feel very overwhelming and people can leave them feeling utterly disempowered. So there were, there were ideas around uh, access and generosity and how we not only took care with each individual work coming into the midst at various stages of, of development and production, but also how we connected them together. Um, there's this very beautiful floor sheet, mine's, mine's folded up, but they're, they're there on, um, on the stage as you come in, which, you know, really dives into each of the works. And there was a discussion that maybe we should just leave it at that and, and not have any 
labels or texts or didactics in the, in the gallery itself. But Stuart, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how we came to this idea around these kind of um, gently leaning offerings that in many respects offer the same sort of um, material and depth that the floor sheet does, but also even thinking about the fact that we had lighting levels to deal with, disparate um, sound works, as well as wanting to kind of even put the typeface in a really legible, large form so that people could read them quite easily. Yeah. Um, so there were a handful of things there. Um, I guess, yeah, continuing from the, um, like, f finding our way with the, um, with the algae vinyl, um, we... There were also like a lot of the other elements of the exhibition design kind of uh, evolved as well. There was sort of, there was an early idea that rather than putting vinyl, we could um, utilize a technique that I'd seen elsewhere that was screen printing. Um, you make up screens and you screen print directly onto the walls and it's this really beautiful kind of crisp finish. And we were going to use um, waste inks from the screen printer to, you know, to, to print this, um, uh, this kind of, you know, rainbow effect of whatever colours we kind of found in the corner at the screen printer. Um, and we discovered, you know, through trying to do that, that there's not really the expertise to do that here, but also the, um, the people that we spoke to kind of pointed to you know, the, the kind of emulsions that you, and the chemical um, uh, uh, footprint that you would generate by doing that much kind of screen printing in a place like this. And so like, mm, okay, that's not a good idea then. <laughs> um, and, um, and then there was, uh, there was another kind of, there was a, there was a legacy idea from the, a sort of earlier discussion about, um, you know, looking basically in the basement here because any exhibition space of that's had any kind of history um, has used a lot of materials and and really like that's like part of the proposition of this show as to how to think about um, the things we make more consciously um, and exhibition making has you know we we're actually we were just talking about it just before here like there's there's kind of in some ways kind of great efficiency of bringing people together rather than people trying to travel all around to see works but also there's great kind of um, uh, material footprint in making an exhibition usually. Um, and, you know, to the um, uh, credit of the team here, there's like reuse is kind of, um, is thought about and kind of embedded here, but there is, you know, still like a catalog of stuff downstairs that's sort of waiting for that kind of reuse. And so the, the thing that we wanted to do here is kind of deliberately um, really expose that, kind of bring it bring them out, print on them, um, and use them as, as like this diverse range of materials, less diverse than actually exists downstairs, but, um, but you know, like we wanted there to be some, um, uh, you know, visual consistency as we went around. So there was a choice of different kinds of timbers, different kinds of cardboard, different kinds of MDF and particle board, um, occasional differences in um, these sort of felt acoustic panels that are the introductions. Um, the occasional bit of shiny bling that sort of pops out of, of, of a corner here and there. Um, but we made these kind of, um, in the end, these sort of, these odd, delightful um, clusters of materials that, that seem to tell a little bit of a kind of history of this place. Um, and, and also like, you know, wore on their sleeve what they were, what they were doing as part of the show. Which really brings me a little bit back to this idea of care because, um, Jesse, I'm going to ask you to, in a moment to just reflect on the paintings themselves and, and the movement uh, through the robotic um, mechanisms. But just before we talk about that, I do want to say that this is only possible when you have a team that's all working together. And what I would say is that... Um, one of the delights about working in this context, or one of the real opportunities, I should say, about working in this context, is 
working with the production team. I know we've got Eric North here today and, and uh, Tim Mason, the whole team, and also Lisa and Julia and their team, is that we're kind of all in it together. And perhaps unlike a more, um, not all galleries and museums work like this now, but perhaps more than a traditional slowness of a more museological context where one department does something, then passes it on to the next department, then it passes on to the next department, the labels get written, you know, the exhibition gets, design gets done and, they, and they're really separate conversations. Here there is this overlapping, sometimes very intense, but, and sometimes very challenging, but also this incredible commitment by uh, the team here, Eric and the team, to really test these ideas within often very limited means. Um, and certainly that's true of, I mean, it looks very beautiful and very kind of simple on the walls, but actually the intent of being able to catalogue that material, cut it very quickly, work with the production people to turn it around, and then, Jesse, um, I'm going to talk to some of the other works in a minute, but I particularly want to focus on the algae paintings because these works in this space had a real opportunity for you to, again, test how they would work with the robotic devices. Can you talk a little bit about, A, why that was important and, B, your kind of uh, relationship with the crew in terms of testing that and making it happen? Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I'm one thing that um, is really evident here is that the team is absolutely incredible. Um, Simon in particular um, and Eric and Tim spent so much time uh, working with these. So um, at the very top of each of the uh, panels, you'll see a, a little kind of bit and that, that's a robot that was made by uh, an artist named Michael Candy. And one of the other challenges is that he has moved to Slovenia now. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so he hasn't been here. Um, and Simon, in particular, has been doing what he would love to be doing if he was here, which is to tinker with these. Um, they're custom-made robots. Uh, basically, uh, I said to Michael, I, I want to be able to move them up and down, which seems really simple, but... Um, it's tricky to do. Um, so he designed these with these very elegant systems where there's a, a rod and, and some robotic drivers and, um, and they do that. But uh, the robots misbehave at times and, and a couple of them did uh, continue to lever up and they're actually quite powerful motors in them, as Michael has told me. So, um, so they did kind of get past their little safety bits and, and had to be fixed. Um, so we're actually, we're not running them the whole time because uh, we're scared that they're going to continue to wind themselves up <laughs> past their point. Uh, and Michael being so far away, um, he's not here to fix them, so. Yes, very inconveniently moved to Slovenia. Um, but actually, it has been, uh, again, a really good process. And, and Simon, particularly, has been working on this with Jesse. And we did, anyone who was here opening now, you would have seen them move up and down. So again, the opportunity to test things in the real with public audiences in an exchange with public audiences that, that uh, exposes that thinking. And there is a program around them, so you will get to see them move throughout the life of, of the exhibition. We've worked out that the red one behave, misbehaves a bit more than the others. Um, so again, these kind of materials and their um, mechanisms around them seem to have, have their own life. Um, I do want to just quickly talk about some of the other works. I'm not going to go through each of the works today. The, the purpose for this talk is more about the making of the exhibition. Um, and there's an incredible program over 20 events over the next eight weeks of which you can dive more deeply into each of the individual works. But I do want to talk about, particularly, Jesse, it'd be great to get your reflections on um, 
the context of these three works at the front with your own work. And it was very important for us as the curatorium to really foreground Indigenous knowledges as being absolutely central to this movement towards a planetary commons. Um, clearly learning and listening deeply to Indigenous elders and communities is key to that thinking. And again, um, we, we've spoken about that in depth uh, through the lecture at the Capitol the other night and throughout this exhibition. These three works in the beginning are all, again, uh, in different modes, perhaps, of, of what we're loosely calling modes of address. We were so fortunate to work with Vicky Cousins uh, with this wonderful work at the front, um, Earth Dance, which really brings our attention to the connection between sea country and a sky country and earth country as being absolutely interlinked. Um, and what's really important, again, is that these works are artworks within themselves, which you can come and see in the gallery, but really importantly, it's about the conversations. So that conversations for a planetary commons is absolutely key to this exhibition. So the programs are equal to the exhibitable works in terms of um, exchange and uh, there to draw out those conversations in, in more depth. So with Vicky, uh, there'll be a discussion at the Capitol, which is called To Follow the Old Ways, um, which really looks at her work, particularly with uh, her community and her daughter around the Southern Ocean Protection Embassy Collective. So thinking about particularly whale songlines. So again, these works as a platform for those bigger conversations like your own, Jesse. Um, then this work over here by Sarah Lynn Rees with um, Mark Jakes from Open Work and Icon Science speaks to, again, like Jesse's work, that ability to test things that are, are, are kind of prototypical. So this work uh, called Post Infrastructure is actually uh, a work that's uh, a live prototype for a current project in development in the city of Melbourne. This project can't be named at this point. So what's even more exciting is that this might actually prompt the furthering of this project and the research around it. And it's really looking on the speculation of this construction as a, a multivalent tree. So the idea that this uh, these kind of tree-like poles could be deployed around the city alongside real trees and support a habitat while those trees are growing. And these little boxes that you can see on uh, these forms are habitat boxes. So they uh, can be installed and also adapted to different types of species. Uh, and then also, obviously, they're analogue, but then they can be supported through digital means, through uh, sensors and cameras that can track how species are interacting with these poles and the habitat boxes supporting the trees that are growing up around them in the city of Melbourne, and they can be tuned and, and further developed. So these uh, two works, along with Dean Cross's work here, which is actually, again, an invited artwork, um, and Dean's work is just this beautiful performance of his country and this waterhole where he's, he's uh, you know, performing and rubbing his body with the clay that used to be extracted from that waterhole to make clay bricks. Uh, and is now a thriving ecosystem once again. So again, this idea of, of learning from Indigenous knowledges. So it was really important, I think, that this work was uh, foregrounded at the very front of the exhibition. And alongside, Jesse, your own work, uh, and uh, in terms of that kind of mode of invited works, existing artworks, but also works in process. Did you want to comment a little bit on, on that at all, how you found those connections and, and uh, that process for you? Yeah, um, so, so the work here is called um, To Sow the Wind and Reap the Whirlwind, and um, that's a, it's a kind of historical idiom which, which speaks to consequences of, of, I guess, what I'm thinking about is, is the use of natural resources. Um, so we've obviously kind of, we've been using 
natural resources of, as a Western culture um, far beyond what we should and far beyond what's sustainable. So I think, um, I guess, particularly as, a, as an Australian, um, as someone that is living on someone else's country, um, being particularly mindful of, of what we're using and how we're using it. Um, and again, that, that idea of things that we're using once and, and, and I guess throwing away and, and then not really having much responsibility of after that. Um, so I think it, it, it's been particularly nice to be uh, surrounded by these works that also speak to the natural world and to, um, to these kind of systems that we, that we do live within and that we, we need to respect more. Um, the, the movement um, was intended to kind of, I guess, replicate these natural cycles. It will still do that. Um, sometimes things move slower, but, um, but yeah, I think there's a there's a change in composition that you will see um, as the show goes on. They'll they'll move and change positions. So um, yeah, I think we're thinking about this this change of of how we need to change how we live, but also that things have changed in the past and and can change in the future. I also just wanted to quickly touch on this work right behind us here. Uh, which is, is actually two works that have come together. And again, through the process of making the exhibition and speaking with all of the creative practitioners and architects and designers, what became really apparent, as it did with you, Jesse and Stuart, through the algae um, work in the graphics, was where there were opportunities to perhaps bring... Uh, people who had responded to the show, there was an expression of interest uh, within the university to uh, be involved in the show and we had a tremendous response. So, but again, given this really short development time, where were there opportunities for those overlaps? So this work behind us really speaks really clearly to that opportunity. Uh, it's called Mongrel Assemblies and Quarry TV Broadcast. And Caitlin Parry and Helen Duong from Mongrel Assemblies uh, came together with these other projects we do together, Millie Catlin and Joseph Norster. And what you can see here is a structure that's constructed out of materials from uh, the NGV architecture uh, pavilion. And in a, in a kind of gesture, almost of reverse uh, patronage or, or kind of care, these are the projects we do together, Millie and Joe. They have a quarry uh, that they're slowly working with and are rehabilitating, um, kind of using as a research project very slowly in the Otways. And they take these materials that are very, that the NGV work with them on, and they take the materials back to the quarry and they care for these materials. They take them apart and they bring them back to forms where they can be reused. So for us, it was really interesting, not only the quarry project itself as a kind of ecology that they're caring for, but also this material care. So the structure, as I said, is constructed out of parts of those former pavilions. There's about four different pavilions in this structure behind us. Um, and then what was really exciting was Caitlin Parry, who came on board with Helen, their project um, not only designed and documented the structure itself, but also brought together an NFT platform around how these materials could be most efficiently reused for other purposes, but also, really importantly, how they could be shared more efficiently. Because I guess just like us, we found material at the bottom of this very building, but how do you come into contact with these materials. So their project also includes an expression of interest of which anyone coming into the exhibition can um, put in an expression of interest to have some of those materials to take them, to reuse them, and for that uh, to be upscaled in, in terms of its impact. So again, these projects are, are really important in terms of bringing people together to amplify uh, that research and work. Um, it brings me almost, we're almost getting to the point where we're going to open up to the floor. But before we do, Stuart, uh, you were involved in uh, 
a work that is in uh, the next gallery. And when we wrap the talk uh, after questions, we'll go into the next gallery and we can talk a little bit more about this work um, by Machine Listening. So Machine Listening is Joel Stern, who I mentioned before with James Parker and Sean Dockray. And their work is Environments 12. And Environments 12 was um, a very popular um, series of vinyls and sound works from, I think, 69 to 79, if, if I'm right. And um, this work is a speculative next album for that series. And it really captures field recordings from an imagined future world, a kind of series of, of fables, if you like, where the environment itself has been updated and where... Um, Things such as loudspeakers and microphones are laced through the environment and biosphere along with natural systems. So I just want to ask Stuart a little bit about that collaboration because part of the collaboration included a record sleeve or a vinyl sleeve which has these really beautiful liner notes and I'd encourage you all, it's about 34 minutes in duration so you need some time but to read through those liner notes that take you through these fables. Can you tell us a little bit more about your collaboration on that work? Sure, yeah. Um, I brought one from the other room. <laughs> um, and so basically this is a, like a, a record sleeve. Um, um, shortly there's gonna, the, the, they'll make a, like cut a record of the work, um, which will go in, into, into these. That'll be sort of a next iteration of the work. But, um, but basically the, yeah, environments um, one to 11 were, were the, the records from 69 to 79. And um, basically they were, they were the, the, or the, the first one was like really a, a, a first kind of popular um, experiment in bringing um, field recordings into like people's lounge rooms and having, you know, um, having them having like the sound of an ocean play while you were having a dinner party or you know sounds very much like the 70s doesn't it um, but they're there and so there are 11 of these um, and they're kind of this speculative sort of um, uh, basis for this project is kind of a, like it, it starts from there and it goes through other uses of soundscapes in other um, situations like the um, the design of sound environments in zoos for the benefit of animals um, and through to a new kind of um, uh, emerging science called uh, acoustic enrichment um, and there's a photograph on, the, on this version of the cover um, where up to a certain point the sounds of a healthy reef can be played to a degraded reef and help heal that reef, so, um, which sounds like science fiction, but, um, uh, but basically like, like blending those ideas, their, their um, idea also through making, um, uh, they wrote it, this series of scenarios and made this sound work with like um, uh, AI generated like clones of, the, of these voice actors um, and, and made this work that, that, that takes you through a kind of series of these of these scenarios and situations. Um, the liner note, so basically, so this is the other version, which is an environments 12 with environments one on its on its cover. Um, um, but basically there's a there are there are ten kind of different versions of the of the possible record over there at the moment. Um, the liner notes, you know, like take you through a series of, of of these scenes, and I guess the idea with you know we work through again a lot of a lot of versions of this, but the the idea in the end was um, to stick reasonably closely to the kind of visual language of the original um, records, but take them into somewhere else through the way we made it and the inclusion of this kind of strange cacophony of diagrams on the on on the reverse. 
I think that's, and there is such a wonderful connection between Joel's work and these kind of uh, incredible fables and then also uh, Piero's work with urchin corals, which is also working at the very forefront of, of coral uh, rejuvenation and uh, particularly through these self-seeding pods. So one coming from very much a kind of research perspective and Joel's work also deeply embedded in research, but also from a, a kind of more poetic and artistic um, perspective. So I think that's a really good point to open it up to some questions, if there's any from the floor. Actual plastics have a terrible long life. I'm wondering in various circumstances, do these automatically degrade or is there a, a set of, um, you know, <clears throat> ways that they will last? Yeah. Um, so they can... Um, I actually wanted to talk about the plastic to begin with because um, in my research what I've found is that the, the timeline that's given for a lot of petrochemical plastics about how long they will last um, is actually based on how long it will take an organism to evolve to degrade them, not for them to degrade. Um, so we already have some, um, we're kind of ahead of the timeline, some uh, wax moths and there are some other the bacteria that have um, already started to evolve, but uh, the volume that we have created is, is too big. Um, on this material, uh, so um, it, I was just thinking about how deep to go. On a molecular level, it's, it's a more simple um, molecular structure for the polymer, and so it can be degraded much more readily than those, those petrochemicals. It is actually degrades uh, more readily than, um, than some other kind of commonly used bioplastics, so the, the PLAs or the polylactic acid starch ones. Um, this will degrade uh, faster than those, so the, the, um, the molecules will kind of unknit um, faster. Uh, it is controllable, they can, be, they can be kept. The main thing that degrades it is um, hydrolysis, so uh, not a surprise. Um, the thing that is the, the, the catalyst for it to actually become a liquid again and to be reused is the thing that degrades it the most. Um, so to find that out, we did uh, some spectra scans, which, which look at all the molecules, um, how they're, they're changing and what, what bonds are changing over time. So we tested a lot of different um, samples that had been aged differently. Um, the other thing that happens with plastics, and it happens with all plastics, is that the, um, the additives that are added um, to control how malleable they are tend to migrate. So the plasticizers um, will migrate. I use a vegetable. Um, plasticizer uh, and it does migrate. So probably about around a five year is, is how long it will be stable if it's kind of kept. Um, but that's also how long I've been making them. So uh, the testing is, is ongoing. Um, but yeah, that, that's what this experimental thing is about. We're doing a test right now by having the, the, the vinyl on the outside of the, of the glass. Yes, and we have had a few discussions in terms of what we do, in terms of its durability, do we replace them, do we let them degrade, you know, all of those aspects of, of uh, testing this in, in real time. Um, and obviously as the exhibition closes, that material will all go back to Jesse and uh, it can be reused and, and circulated. And these kind of exhibition panels will all go back into the school. They can be used in their current form and simply flipped over or uh, reused for materials for teaching and learning purposes or research. Any other questions? Kenzie. Thanks very much for the discussion. Um, and you've just sort of partially answered the question that I was going to ask. Um, and it's really um, wonderful to see like a different approach to exhibition making with uh, particularly with um, exhibition texts and that kind of thing. But I'm just wondering, like, if, and there might not be an answer to this, it's something that I'm thinking through. 
Like how do you uh, continue to make exhibitions and especially exhibition furniture, build walls, that kind of thing? How do you um, like translate or transfer this approach from this exhibition to future exhibitions? Like, having worked in institutions myself, you know, like maybe one exhibition will will um, have a real sustainable focus, and then the next exhibition sort of undoes all that work. Um, like, is there a way to to kind of I don't know, make make exhibitions sustainably? Yeah, it's Eve. Um beautifully kind of prefaced my uh, closing comments because I think that is absolutely the challenge. And um, I would say really clearly that we're also really aware that there's still a lot of, um, there's lighting, there's power, there's video, there's all of those kind of aspects of a footprint. So I guess the challenge is in a space such as this, which is a challenging space on a number of levels, both in terms of its spatial qualities and its accessibility. This is a hard building sometimes to cross over the threshold, particularly for public audiences. They can feel like this is a space that's not for them. So one of the things I think over many years that uh, everyone in this gallery team has uh, struggled with is how do you create a space of encounter and that kind of space of encounter for these works or programs is really important. But also, how do you do that with very limited means? In the past, that's sometimes been budgetary means, but now is actually about being mindful and thoughtful, particularly, again, in budgetary constraints, but more importantly, with the practitioners around us who are all committed to a different form of exhibition making. So, I mean, pretty much things like all of these platforms are reused in this case, and um, Eric and, and Simon and Tim and the whole team have, have a pretty comprehensive kit now of which they share not only within this gallery, but across the institution and also other institutions so that we stop if we can, producing more and more material. So that's, that's a really important aspect of it. The other thing I would say is, and we were talking about this as we started the, the conversation today, is how we start to think in a more distributed way as not only a city in Melbourne, but a region and nationally. So how perhaps we all stop making individual exhibitions and how we might share them and think about how other people access them in different ways to again use that time and material and resource really effectively um, and also freight is a big thing there's no overseas or international freight in this exhibition there's very very minimal transport most of it I think was Eric picking things up or or um, boom but just thinking through things like that um, and flights is another thing for anyone international. That's obviously something we've all got to get our head around. It's, it's really wonderful to have those personal connections and to have people come into the country and have those abilities for exchange. Sometimes it's vital um, and other times maybe it's not so vital and we can do it um, remotely. But I think on that note, I would like to just say thank you to you all for being here today on a Friday lunchtime and thank you to Stuart and Jesse for so generously sharing the process and exposing some of the challenges as well as the opportunities. Thank you to Lisa and the program team at RMIT Culture and of course again to Eric North and, and his team who are all part of RMIT Culture and just to finally say this is part of the Now or Never program. Uh, but we do have eight weeks duration for this show, so lots of really fantastic programs on, uh, I think there's over 20 in all. So thanks very much for being here. I invite you informally as we finish today uh, to come into the next gallery and we'll be around to talk through any of the works for at least the next kind of half an hour uh, should you want, want to have more of a conversation. Thanks so much. <laughs>